Several years ago, we had an art show at our church, and people brought in all kinds of sculptures and paintings, and we put them on display, and there was this one piece that had a quote from Gandhi in it. And lots of people found this piece compelling. They'd stop and sort of stare at it and take it in and reflect on it, but not everybody found it that compelling. Somewhere in the course of the art show, somebody attached a handwritten note to the piece, and on the note, they had written, reality check, he's in hell. Gandhi's in hell? He is? And someone knows this for sure and, and felt the need to let the rest of us know? Will only a few select people make it to heaven and will billions and billions of people burn forever in hell? And if that's the case, how do you become one of the few? Is it what you believe or what you say or what you do or who you know or something that happens in your heart? Or do you need to be initiated or baptized or take a class or converted or being born again? How does one become one of these few? And then there is the question behind the questions. The real question, what is God like? Because millions and millions of people were taught that the primary message, the center of the gospel of Jesus, is that God is going to send you to hell unless you believe in Jesus. And so what gets subtly sort of caught and taught is that Jesus rescues you from God. But what kind of God is that, that we would need to be rescued? One megachurch pastor has ignited a theological firestorm by suggesting that our response to the Christian message in this life will not necessarily determine our eternal destiny. In his book, Love Wins, Heaven, Hell and the Fate of Every Person Who Ever Lived, Rob Bell says that ultimately all people will be saved, when though, even those who've rejected the claims of Christianity. He argues people will eventually be persuaded by God's love, post-mortem in the life to to come. And Pastor Rob Bell joins us now. Good afternoon, sir. This book you've written has been stirring some controversy because the implication is, as you put it, God's love will eventually melt hearts. That's what you say in the book. So are you a universalist who believes that everyone can go to heaven regardless of how they respond to Christ on earth? Um, in, in regards to the question, are you a universalist, I would say first and foremost, no. And that is a perspective within the Christian stream. There has been, within the Christian tradition, a number of people who have said, given enough time, God will win everybody over. Um, one of the things in the book I'm very clear on and, and want people to see is that this tradition has all of these different opinions. Everybody will be won over. Some will continue to resist God's love. And that Christians have disagreed about this speculation. I, I, I get that. And so, so so is it irrelevant and is it immaterial about how one responds to Christ in this life in terms of determining one's eternal destiny? Is that immaterial? I think it's extraordinarily important. I think it's extraordinarily important. in your important. book you said that God wins regardless in the end. Um, love wins for me is a way of understanding that God is love and love demands freedom. You are asking for it both ways. That doesn't make sense. I'm asking you. Is it irrelevant as to how you respond to Christ in your life now to determine your eternal destiny? Is that irrelevant? Is it immaterial? It is terribly relevant and terribly important. Now, how exactly that works out and how exactly it works out in the future, we are now, when you die, firmly in the realm of speculation. And my experience has been that a lot of Christians have built whole dogmas about what happens when you die, and we have to be very careful that we don't build whole doctrines and dogmas on what is speculation. I, Jesus, I, I'm not talking about okay. what happens when you die. I'm asking you how you respond here and now. And the question I'm asking you, and what yes. you seem to be saying in this book, yep. is that God will love, will melt everyone's heart eventually, some even post-mortem in death. So you're the one making the speculation about the afterlife. Same but you, you've just indicated, though, one of the problems with this book, which is, in a sense, you're creating a Christian message that's warm, kind, and popular for contemporary culture, but it's frankly, according to this critic, unbiblical and historically unreliable. 
That's true, isn't it? No. What it's you've not done true. is you're amending the gospel, the Christian message, so that it's palatable to contemporary people who find, for example, the idea of hell and heaven very difficult to stomach. So here comes Rob Bell. He's made a Christian <laughs> gospel for you, and it's perfectly palatable. It's much easier to swallow. That's what you've done, haven't you? No, I haven't. And there's actually an entire chapter in the book on hell. And there's an, I mean, throughout the book, over and over again, our choices matter. The decisions we make about whether we extend love to others or not, the ways in which we resist or we open ourselves to God's love, these are incredibly important. How much, how much is this book you working out your own childhood experience of being brought up in a fairly cramped evangelical family and really finding that difficult as you became an adult? How much is this actually that? Oh, I would totally own up to that in a heartbeat. I don't think hell exists. I happen to believe in life after death, but I don't think it's got a thing to do with reward and punishment. And if you have heaven as a place where you're rewarded for your goodness and hell as a place where you're punished for your evil, then you sort of have control of the population. And so they create this fiery place, which has quite literally scared the hell out of a lot of people. You and I are emerging people, not fallen people. Our problem is not that we are born in sin. Our problem is we do not yet know how to achieve being fully human. The function of the Christ is not to rescue the sinners, but to empower you and to call you to be more deeply and fully human. What is Toki and the Ghost? This is Toki and the Ghost. <sighs> Toki and the Ghost is simply putting your fingers together in the form of smoking a joint. But instead of smoking an illegal substance that's harmful for the body, you are inhaling the Holy Ghost with the access point of putting your fingers together looking like you're smoking a marijuana cigarette. But in fact, you are receiving impartation from Almighty God. And then you expect me to get up and say coherent words later, afterwards. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Oh, dear Jesus. Oh, Lord. I've learned a, a quick prayer. I'll teach it to all you really quickly. Okie dokie, Lord. Okie dokie. Lord, I love your heavy, drunken glory. You have a teaching That's gift. <laughs> just a uh, drunken rampage for several days of just, you know, just binge drinking and overdosing on glory cane and co-crucified cane and uh, a lot of Godka, a lot of Jehovah, a lot of destroying the works of the devil. And, you know, it's great. It's awesome that we get to have increasing glory. <laughs> increasing glory this week over last week. Or the Bible's not true. Ourselves. Don't leave us to yes. our foolish thinking. Lord, we want all that you have, all, yes. all that you have. Yes. And Lord, if it blows our little minds, let them be blown. <laughs> Father, we want all of what you have, all of what you have. We thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the Lord said to me, will you howl for me? I said, don't ask me to do that, Lord. He said, if I ask you, will you do it? 
He said, if I can't ask you to do something in your own house, how are you going to do it out there? So... to think they was drunk, they must have thought they was drunk. They were acting like drunks. Hey. <laughs> 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 Once again! This is the first time we've had a full manifestation of that anointing. We got there. Your victory is secured by knowing your place, position, and possession bought for you at Calvary's Cross. Once again, here's Paula and Pastor Larry Huck with more on The Seven Places Jesus Shed His Blood. You better get up and call the toll-free number. Seven Places Jesus Shed His Blood. If you want dominion, you want authority, you want to break the spirit of poverty, sickness, disease, generational curse. And, and I, really, people need the product. That's they the bottom really, line. They, I now come into a priestly anointing. Jesus is not the only begotten on. Son of God. He is not. I am a Son of He's God. He's the first fruit. If you have it, you're the, he's the first fruit. He's the first born of many. For the, Jesus said, don't pray to me. Mm -hmm. I'll not go to the Father for you. You go to the Father because that curtain is open and my blood has a tone for you go on in until I learn the third place that Jesus shed his blood to break the curse of poverty and, and I want to hit that because poverty is it a is a curse. curse absolutely let's deal with the phrase the poor Jesus the history channel or somebody went back and began to examine the economic position of Jesus that Jesus being a carpenter and Jesus, you know, been connected with Joseph and where he lived and all this stuff. They had to conclude there was no way he could have been poor. How in the world can the anointed one, the Christ, who has the anointing, how is it that the anointing's not producing for him? But it's supposed to do all this for us, but it didn't do nothing for poor Jesus. So many people make excuses for their poverty today, holding on to the era that Jesus was poor. What do you need? I need money. Then start creating it. Start speaking about it. Start speaking it into being. Speak to your billfold. Say, you big, thick billfold full of money. Speak to your checkbook. Say, you checkbook, you've never been so prosperous since I owned you. You're just jammed full of money. Shepherds get it first, then the sheep get it. Because sheep follow shepherds. If we, if, if we shepherds follow sheep, we're going to have poo on, on, on our shoes. God always blesses the shepherds first. So a pastor can never see his church prosper if he's poor.
as long, my sister, I know you've been reading the Bible, but as long as we say it's laid up, the wicked going to keep it. But God says time for us to tell that money, you don't belong to the wicked, you belong to us. And I want you to get in the right place. Money coming to me now. That yoke is broken tonight over you in the name of Jesus. You are going to receive your money tonight in Jesus' name. Oh, tonight, my bills are being paid. Tonight, my money is coming to me. Now, while you walking, keep walking. I'm going to keep preaching. You keep walking, I'm going to keep preaching. How can you glorify God in your body when it doesn't function right? How can you glorify God? How can He get glory when your body doesn't even work? And the Bible says your body is the temple. He lives, the Holy Spirit lives in your body. What makes you think the Holy Ghost wants to live inside of a body where it can't see out through the windows and it can't hear with the ears? What makes you think the Holy Spirit wants to live inside of a physical body where the limbs and the organs and the cells do not function right? All through the day, we should be dwelling on, this is going to be a great day. God's favor is on my life. Blessings are chasing me down. No obstacle is too big for me. I know I'm more than a conqueror. When you do that, you're programming your mind for victory. Jesus put it this way, you will become what you believe. That means if you believe you'll always be heavy, then you'll always be heavy. If you believe you'll never break that addiction, then you'll never break it. Your own thoughts will set the limits for your life. You need to reprogram your thinking. All through the day, we should be dwelling on, this is going to be a great day. God's favor is on my life. Blessings are chasing me down. No obstacle is too big for me. I know I'm more than a conqueror. We've had ministers on who said, your record don't count. You either believe in Christ or you don't. If you believe in Christ, you are, you are going to heaven. And if you don't, no matter what you've done in your life, yeah. you ain't. Yeah, it's, I don't know. It's, there's probably a, a balance between, I believe you have to know Christ, but I think that if you know Christ, if you're a believer in God, you're going to have some good works. And I think it's a cop out to say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't ever do anything to well, help What anybody. if you're Jewish or Muslim and you don't accept Christ at all? You know, I, I just, I'm very careful about saying who and would and wouldn't go to heaven. I don't know. I think only God. you believe you have to believe in Christ. I so believe they're it. They're wrong, aren't they? Well, people? I don't know if I believe they're wrong. I believe here's what the Bible teaches. And from the Christian faith, this is what I believe. But I just think that only God can judge a person's heart. I've spent a lot of time in India with my father. And, uh, you know, I don't know all about their religion. But I know they love God. And I don't know. I'd have to, you know, I've seen their sincerity. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Phoenix, Arizona. Hello. Hello, Larry. You're the best. Thank and you. thank you, Joe, Joel, for your positive messages and your book. I'm wondering, though, um, why you sidestepped Larry's earlier question about how we get to heaven. Um, the Bible clearly tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way that the Father is through him. That's not really a message of condemnation, but of truth. I would agree with her. I believe so that. Then That's what you was not going to No, I... I well, you can't... Well, no, here's my thing, Larry, is I can't judge somebody's heart. I think it's wrong when we go around saying, you know, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, because it's not exactly my way. Is a Mormon a true Christian? Well, in my mind they are. Mitt Romney has said that he believes in Christ as his Savior, and that's what I believe. So, you know, I'm not the one to judge the, the little details of it. We'll start talking about Joseph Smith, the founder of the church, and the Golden Tablets in upstate New York, and, uh, and God uh, assumes the shape of a man. Do you not get hung up in, in those theological issues? I probably don't get hung up in them because I haven't really studied them or thought about them and um, you know I just try to let God be the judge of that. I, I mean um, I don't know I, I certainly can't say that I agree with everything that I've heard about it but from what I've heard from Mitt when he says that Christ is his Savior to, to me that's, that's, a, that's a common bond. When I read in the Bible where he says I am I just smile and say yes I am too.
touch this choir, Lord. Touch! Just the choir. Did you see that? Now, take that which is upon me now. Release it. Release it. Faith, when everything around you looks dark and dim, is discerning the times and season by getting a hope from God. Um, whew, getting, getting a hope from God. <laughs> To be able to see, to discern the times and the seasons that's ahead of you. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant. It was a wild elephant. A wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. And the elephant means a great impact. I said, God, I've prayed for like a hundred crippled people, not one. He said, that's because I want you to grab that lady's crippled legs and bang them up and down on the platform like a baseball bat. And I started going, be healed! Be healed! I started banging them up and down on the platform. She got healed. And I'm thinking, God, why is not the power of God moving? He said, because you haven't kicked that woman in the face. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face. With your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. BAM! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. 